Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. All right, well, before we get started, a few notes. First of all, today is Pearl Harbor Day. And over on the War Podcast, which is available at thewar.greatdetectives.net. That's thewar.greatdetectives.net. We have posted our 80-minute uh, Pearl Harbor special, and uh, I would encourage you to uh, take a listen to that, even if you're not following the rest of the series. Uh, I've got some good material there, and uh, you can also... Um, uh, subscribe to the podcast over at thewar.greatdetectives.net. Also, I do want to encourage you to pick up your copy of What Made the Golden Age Shine for the Kindle. Uh, in it, we take a look at uh, just a wide variety of, of Golden Age programs and what made them so special. So pick up your copy over at uh, amazon.com for your Kindle. But let's go ahead and take a listen to today's episode of The Lineup. This one is called Teacher's Pet. We take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. <laughs> Funny to be on this side of the wire, huh? Yeah, it pays off better, Frankie. Yeah, we'll find that out. Well, we can sit here. Well, oh, just routine, Frankie. You used to know most of the junkies in town. Maybe you can tip us. Sure, Lieutenant. Glad to help. Of course, I got a wife and kid, you know. There's nothing to worry about. Yeah. Yeah, sure. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the screen in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him out. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. Keep it moving, boys. Over here to the end of the stage. That's right, step it up. Right over here to the end. Now turn, all of you, and face the screen. That's it. Stand still. Keep your hands at your sides. When you answer my questions, don't mumble. The people out there on the other side of the screen want to hear you. So talk up. All right, number one, George Ashar. Concealed weapons. Step right up there, George. That's it. Where do you live, George? Uh, I ain't got no address. Talk up, George. The park, the park. Before that? Same place. How long you been in town, George? Oh, three or four days. Where'd you come from? Oh, uh, West. Somewhere's West. Where, George? Q. San Quentin, 1 to 10, armed robbery. Where'd you get the gun, George? What gun? The gun you were carrying when the officers arrested you. Didn't have no gun. They found a 765 Luger automatic in your coat pocket, George. They did? That's right. Where'd you get it? Didn't have no gun. Frankie. Nah, nothing. All right, nothing. slide down, George. Number two, Jeffrey Capstaff, vagrancy. Step right up there, Jeff. That's it. Keep those hands at your sides. <laughs> sure, look at it. Anything you say. Only I ain't no vagrant. Uh, where do you live, Jeff? Oh, West Olive Street, Sergeant. And where on Olive Street? John's Flea Bag. <laughs> oh, I don't know the right name. It's in the 400 block on the north side of the street. 
But I know vaguely about the set sergeant. Oh, that's so, Jeff? Uh, oh, no, not me, sergeant. I'm a guy who believes in doing an honest day's work. Another day, another dollar. <laughs> I always say. What were you doing when the officers picked you up, Jeff? I was looking for work. What kind of work? Oh, any kind of a good, honest job. It don't make no difference to me. Gee, deep sea diving, rain making, just any kind of job. Huh? You were picked up at one in the morning, Jeff. Yeah, oh, boy. I was really trying that day. All right. <clears throat> Number three, Gentry Dawson, narcotics. Step right up there, Gentry. Yeah. Right, face the yeah. screen. Oh, quite. I kept more of them. Oh, what's up? Um, we finally picked up the little Silvano. Gentry, Might be a break on those narcotics robberies. Yeah. yeah. Silvano talking? Uh, Not so you've noticed it. He's dead. Come in, Ben. Sit down. Fine says Louis Silvano's dead, Bill. That's right. We picked him up in a routine accident report. Ran his car into the window of Sable's Market, 11.43 last night. Oh, high? Drunk? Just dead. Doc Gorson's making a routine autopsy now. Looks like simple cardiac failure. Boys went over the car. They found these stashed away in the radiator cells. Mm, prescription stuff. Morphine? Heroin? By the time the pushers cut it, it'd be worth maybe, oh, $50,000. Mm. And they tried to burn out the numbers. The lab was able to read them. Came from that Adlon Pharmacy holdup two weeks ago. Well, that's one we can write off the books. Come in. Well, that's an interesting sight. Two police department notables dealing in narcotics. Who's the shoving and who's the junkie? A friend of yours, Captain? Never saw him before. Hey, you jives leave me cold, gentlemen. A pleasant change, I might add, after two hours under hot lights with the mortal remains of Louis Silvano. Uh, what was it, Doc? Cardiac failure? Well, there was a little help from a twenty-two slug. Ballistics is checking it now. Uh, how come it didn't turn up earlier? Silvano needed a haircut. Penetration point was behind the right ear, concealed by hair and the earlobe. Any flash burn? No, but the angle says it was fired from inside the car. Well, a muzzle could have been held right against his head. Could he have done it himself, Doc? Not unless he had a third arm in the middle of his back. Well, somebody did the people of the state a good turn. Still homicide, Ben. Your job to get him. Okay. But it's a dirty trick to pull on the guy who did it. Got anything for us, Bricker? Oh, uh, all right. Silvano slug? Yeah. Well, uh, here's the dope. It's a Winchester and a Western Semi Spire. Soft nose, 22 short, mm -hmm. 100 grain. Designed for varmint shooting. Yeah, that fits. Uh, can you tell us anything about the gun that fired it? Well, the rifling marks are cut sharp and clean. Some microscopic metal particles on it that indicate a new or only slightly used barrel. Mm -hmm. The gun is probably new or only test fired. Most likely a target pistol. Anything else? What do you want me to do? Find the killer for you? You got it, help. Come on, Pete. Are you going to check gun registration? Nothing else to do. We'll go back a couple of years. Oh, talk about that needle in a haystack. Nothing else to do. Well, we could have hit that sandwich machine. I'm starved. Ben. Yeah? Uh, Mr. Person's got this report in a couple of minutes ago. Maybe it ties in with Sylvan. Let's see him. Clocked in at 12.04, a woman by the name of Margaret Benson called and said her husband, name of Harry, had been missing for two days, the night before last, anyway. That's the night we picked up Silvano. Yeah, she uh, gave a pretty complete description. Fit Silvano like a glove. I figured you'd better see him. What do you think, Ben? We better visit Margaret Benson. Won't you? Uh, that's all right, Miss Benson. You're detective? Yes. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Carger. Carter? Uh, Carger. K-A-R-G-E-R. -E Sergeant Carger. Thank you. I got into the habit of getting names correctly. One has to with so many pupils these days. You're a teacher, Mrs. Benson? Yes. Art and music at Tracy High School. I suppose you think I'm a bit foolish calling in about Harry, my husband, as I did. Why should we think that? 
Well, I suppose I have let my imagination run away with me. After all, he's not even ten hours late, but he did say he'd be back early this morning. Mr. Benson was away? Yes, on a business trip. He's a real estate broker, resort properties. He went north somewhere to make an appraisal on the Jude Ranch. He expected to be back this morning at the very latest. I see. His name is Harry? Yes, that's right. Does the name Louis Silvano mean anything to you? Louis Silvano? Yes. No, I don't believe so. Are you sure, Mrs. Benson? Yes, I'm certain. I've never heard it before. Why do you ask? Miss Benson, how long have you been married? Why, it'll be six months Friday. How long had you known Harry Benson before that? Oh, just a couple of weeks. It was what you might call a burrow in courtship. I met him while I was on a vacation. Lieutenant Guthrie. Yes, Miss Benson? My husband's dead, isn't he? We're not sure. We have some pictures with us. May I see them, please? Pete? Yes, yeah, sure. Here they are. Thank you, Sergeant. Yes, that's he. I'm sorry. Lieutenant? Yes? My husband's real name wasn't Harry Benson, was it? No. And that business of his, a real estate broker. He was a criminal, wasn't he? Yes. Was it? Did he meet with a violent death? He was shot, Mrs. Benson. Murdered. I see. I suppose there's something you want me to do, something official. We'd like to take a statement from you at headquarters. Uh, no hurry, though. That's all right. I have no more classes today. I can go with you. If you'll excuse me a moment while I get ready. Well, of course, Miss Benson. Sometimes this is a lousy job. <laughs> Tomorrow night, the Bing Crosby Show returns from vacation, making the fall parade of stars back to CBS Radio just about complete. Bing's guest will be lovely Jane Wyman. Another big musical event of tomorrow evening will be the arrival of the Doris Day Show, moving in to occupy her new CBS Radio time. Remember, arriving tomorrow night, the Bing Crosby Show and the Doris Day Show. This Margaret uh, Yates, was it? Mm-hmm. Former married name. She was a widow. And a respectable school teacher. Owned her own home in a respectable neighborhood. Made a perfect cover-up. So he married her under the phony of Harry Benson. Swell guy. Yep. But somebody murdered him, Ben. I remember. So? I'll try to get him. Okay. Waldo say, Ben? We still got a job to do. You gone through the gun registrations? Yeah, just finished. How'd you make out? You ever gone through those things? Looks like everybody in town owns a twenty-two. Uh, how about the one we're after? I think I got it. Oh, what's the dope? A Colt Woodsman, master target, purchased two days ago from Saunders Gun Shop. What makes you think it's the one we're after? It's registered in the name of Margaret Benson. <laughs> with you is uh, just a sight. No hurry, Saunders. Try that rack second from the window. I've got some new 38s in there. Police positives, officers specials. You'll like them. Hmm. Nice guns, Ben. Saunders carries the best. Yeah, I bought my last one here. Must be eight years ago. Doesn't seem that long, though. Sometimes it seems twice as long. Hmm. Yeah, I guess that one's good. Yeah, those are your real guns, all right. I guarantee a seven-eighths group at 50 feet with any one of them on a term. No, not today, Saunders. We're on a job. Yeah, I knew you would be. You never come in here to buy anything. Just ask questions. Who are you after this time? You sold a Colt Woodsman master target two days ago, remember? I don't forget my guns. I'd never believe you were after her, though. After who? That woman who bought it, Mrs. Benson. 
Real nice lady she was. Then she was the one who bought it. Well, you got it down your registrations, I just told you. Why waste my time, ask? Anybody with her? No. She bought it alone? What's the matter with you, Sergeant? You're deaf? I said nobody was with him. Did she say why she was buying it? <clears throat> yep. Well, what did she say? Yeah, well, said she wanted to do some hunting. I didn't believe her, though. Why not? Well, she didn't know nothing about hunting or guns. I tried to talk her to another gun. That one's kind of heavy for a woman, 36 and a half ounces. Too heavy. She wouldn't listen to me. Well, maybe she wanted to give it to somebody as a present. Well, that's not what she said. Said she wanted it for hunting. <laughs> did she, Lieutenant? Looks like it, Saunders. You looking for Miss Benson? Yes, that's right. You won't find her there. She ain't home. Left about an hour ago. Well, where did she go? Do you know? I didn't get a chance to ask. Probably out of town to visit her daughter, though. Anyway, she took a cab and had some luggage with her. Better call in, Pete. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, think Mrs. Benson was going to visit her daughter? Yeah. Natalie's her name. From her former marriage to Mr. Yates, that was. Uh-huh. Pretty little thing. She is nailing. Hasn't been too well the past three or four months, though. Uh, Natalie lives out of town, does she? Oh, no, no. She lives at home with her mother. Only 17, you know. Goes to Tracy High. But she's out of town now. Well, yes, for about ten days now it's been. There's been relatives somewhere in the east, I understand. I imagine Miss Benson's going to join her, you know. Uh, any idea where in the east? Well, now, Miss Benson never did say. You'd think she'd mention something like that to a good neighbor once in a while, wouldn't you? But she never did say. Oh, Captain Waldo sent out a pickup on her, Ben. Wants us to come in. Okay. Well, thanks for your trouble. I'm sorry we bothered you. Oh, it wasn't no bother. You don't know that I've been of any help to you, though. The principle of mine not to talk about my neighbors to strangers. Well, Ben, she blown town? Looks like it. There's a lot of traveling for a school teacher. Flew to Lexington, Kentucky ten days ago. That was on the fifth. Booked two seats. One in the name of Natalie Benson? Yeah. Who's she? A daughter. Well, she left her there then. Came back alone on the twelfth. Well, that's the day Silvana was shot. Yeah. Who's covering the airport? Quine. You think she'll try for Lexington? I'm pretty sure. The daughter? Well, that's part of it. What are you thinking, Ben? Well, there are two federal hospitals for narcotic addicts. One's at Fort Worth, the other's at Lexington. You want to relieve Quinn? You gave me the job. Well, passengers, Jay T. Thorndike and Marvin Winters report to the reservation desk, please. J.T. Thorndike and Marvin Winters. She here? Yeah, right over there, filling out one of those insurance forms on the machine. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's her. She came in about five minutes ago. She's cleared a ticket through to Lexington, Kentucky, in the name of Margaret Yates, flight 201. Floating out gate B, departure time's in six minutes. Well, that gives us plenty of time. I'll report you in, Ben. Okay, fine. She's almost through. Uh-huh. All right, let's go. Flight 201 for St. Louis, Louisville, Charleston, and Washington. Now loading at gate B. All aboard, please. Hello, Miss Benson. Why, it's Lieutenant Guthrie and Sergeant Carger. You see, I did remember your name, Sergeant. That's right, Miss Benson. How nice to see you again. Are you down here to meet someone? Well, not exactly. I'm leaving myself for Lexington. Going down to visit my daughter there. Yes, uh, we know. Oh, I... Don't remember telling you about it. I'm sorry, Miss Benson. We can't let you go on that plane. You can't? Why not? I think we'd better talk about it down at headquarters. Oh, but it's leaving in a few minutes. My daughter's expecting me in the morning. I'm sorry. Is it about my husband's death? That's right. But I told you all I knew about that before. And my my plane's leaving in, in a minute. I, I can't possibly disappoint my daughter. It's no good, Mrs. Benson. 
We know about the gun. Do you mind if we go out to the concourse entrance for a few minutes? That'll be okay. Thank you. I'm 45 years of age, Lieutenant. My pupils think of me as an old lady. But I don't feel old. Strange, isn't it, that a woman of 45 can have the same emotions, desires, as a girl of 20? Needs to be loved, wanted. Yes, ma'am. I had all that once with Natalie's father. I thought after he died that I'd never want it again. I was wrong. Not enough for a woman to have just a job and a child. It wasn't enough for me. This is the final call for Flight 201. For Maybe I asked Louisville, for too much. Charleston and Washington. I don't know. Now loading at gate B. But when I met him... Final call. That man I knew was Harry Benson. God forgive me. I didn't know what would happen to Natalie. I didn't know. Miss Benson, is she in the Federal Hospital at Lexington? She's there. I took her there myself. She was a lovely child. I took her to that hospital myself for narcotic addicts. And left her there. The day I came back here, I bought that gun and killed him. She was a lovely child, Nanny. I'm sure she was. The day I came back, I killed him. How can men do a thing like that? Sell drugs to children. Turn them into what Natalie turned into. Have you ever seen what it does to them, Lieutenant? I've seen them. I saw it in my own home. Saw my own daughter fly at me like a wild animal when I found the thing she was using. She clawed at me, shrieked like a wild animal. That's when I learned what he was doing. My husband. Selling drugs to the children at Tracy High School. To my own daughter. I don't remember actually planning to kill him. But Natalie, she was a lovely child. That's the plane I was going to take, isn't it? The one for Lexington. Yes. That's it. I'd hoped I could take it. To be with her for a little while. To help her. You've both been very kind. I'm ready to go now. Lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie with Jack Moyles as Sergeant Pete Carter, was written by Sidney Marshall with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Herb Butterfield, Raymond Burr, Howard McNear, Benny Rubin, High Everback, Ted Bliss, Jeanette Nolan, and Virginia Gregg. The lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Like your ladies youthful, full of vigor and more than slightly unpredictable, try Millie Bronson and Judy Graves, both at this corner tomorrow night. For some of the funniest listening of the week, any week, meet Millie and enjoy Junior Miss tomorrow night on most of these same stations presented by CBS Radio.
Dan Coverly speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Wow. Um, this one was a very uh, moving episode. Um, rarely is it that the lineup gives us uh, a, a sympathetic uh, killer or so even a sympathetic criminal. Drawing it tended to do that more. Um, but uh, really, the criminals on the lineup mostly are kind of pathetic. This one... Really, the, the uh, I thought the the final scene in this was just very moving, very well done, and uh, you can understand why she did it, and you can kind of agree with uh, Pete Carter that this is one of those times that the job stank. I should mention that there was one lost episode here. Uh, we cannot find the poker party killings that were uh, broadcast on October the 1st of 1952. Uh, this episode was from October 8th. Um, I thought I had it, but when I listened to it, it was a previous episode. So uh, if we find it, we'll play it for you. But, uh, yeah, we had to skip it this time. But uh, that's, the, uh, I think, the only lost episode during this stretch. All right, well, that will do it for today. Join us on Sunday. We'll have a video theater special. This one's an episode of the 1960s TV show Checkmate. It's one of only three of the episodes of that series to enter the public domain. And I've seen two of them, and this one's the better one. And then join us back here on Monday for yours truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.